All right, we are live, everyone. We're gonna wait. Hello, hello. We're gonna give. We're gonna just chit chat for a moment. Welcome to Nighttime Logic with Gwendolyn Kais and Rebecca mm -hmm. Rowland. We'll, we'll do our introductions in just a second. We'll give everyone a chance to take their seats and get in. And we have our fingers crossed tonight. We're we're, we're talking about weird animal stories before we get started, and uh, we're hoping that Rebecca has a new a, a new cat that may or may not make an appearance. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, she's she's right on the outside of the frame. Wait, wait, she heard you. She's leaving. <laughs> oh my God. She's leaving. Wait, no. It was a strange okay, human that dares invoke whatever. my name. <laughs> well, maybe we can convince her that uh, I won't. We won't talk about strange owls and strange animal stories as we were doing, and we'll we will uh, maybe we'll convince her to come on on camera with our good conversation and the great stories yeah. that we're going to hear tonight. So welcome. <laughs> Welcome everyone uh, to Nighttime Logic. Nighttime Logic is the part or the parts of the story that are felt but not consciously processed. Those that operate below the conscious surface. And that is the theme of uh, the series and really excited tonight to have with us two authors, Rebecca Rowland and Gwendolyn Keist. How are you two doing? Very good, very right. good. Thank you for being here. Yeah. It's, uh, it's great to see you both. I will, um, I'll introduce you two to our viewers and we'll start the night off with some conversation with Rebecca. Rebecca Rowland is the dark fiction author of The Horrors Hiding in Plain Sight, Pieces, Optic Nerve, Shagging the Boss, and the upcoming White Trash and Recycled Nightmares and is the curator of six horror anthologies, including the bestseller Unburied, a collection of queer, dark fiction. Her short fiction and guest essays regularly appear in a variety of online and print venues, and she occasionally reviews collections and anthologies for the websites Ginger, Nuts of Horror, and Horror Tree. Rebecca is an active member of the Horror Writers Association, a reticent member of the Horror Authors Guild and the Whip City wordsmiths and by day an English teacher in an underfunded urban school district. Most of her fiction takes place in the Boston or Western Massachusetts area and despite a love of the ocean and a violent distaste for cold weather, she lives with her family in a landlocked and often icy corner of New England. To surreptitiously stalk her, visit rollinbooks.com and to take a peek at what shiny object she's fixating on these days, follow her on Instagram which is at Rebecca Space Rolling Space Books. Welcome, Rebecca. It's great to have you. It's great to be here. <laughs> great way to spend a Friday. And our other author is Gwendolyn Keist. Gwendolyn Keist is a three-time Bram Stoker award-winning author of The Rust Maidens, Reluctant Immortals, Bone Set in Feathers, and Her Smile Will Untether the Universe, Pretty Mary's All in a Row, and The Invention of Ghosts. Her short fiction and nonfiction have appeared in Nightmare Magazine, Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy, The Starian, Towards Nightfire, Black Static, The Dark, Daily Science Fiction, Interzone, and Lamplight, among others. Originally from Ohio, she now resides on an abandoned horse farm outside Pittsburgh with her husband, two cats, and not nearly enough ghosts. You can find her online at GwendolynKeis.com, and one line that was not in your biography, she's also... Um, the author of Reluctant Immortals, which uh, which yeah. launches this week. So congratulations, uh, congratulations on that. Yeah. So um, welcome to you both. Um, let's start. Let's start off with uh, Rebecca. Rebecca, for um, for readers who have not yet read your work, how would you um, how would you describe it if you could? If you could put it. I know boxes uh, are often just for marketing purposes, but what, what kind of what kind of fiction, what kind of dark fiction do you write? Um, mostly psychological horror, some quiet horror, psychological, um, a little bit of transgressive horror, and a little bit of satirical horror. So, but mostly psychological. I'm I'm I I've tried to kind of experiment with like creature feature and some splatter, but my my sort of my safe place is definitely psychological. Well, I mean, we're, uh, we're we're barking up the same tree to use our, our bad, weird animal uh, 
animal <laughs> <laughs> analogies here. We're making the same strange animal noises in the night. I mean, I'm I'm one of the things I'm really impressed of is just yeah, just just your knowledge of the different you know the different kinds of horror and your ability just to write, um, you know, to uh, to have to have your main thrust, but also to write um, in those different wheelhouses. Um, it's yeah, you know, it's really exciting to me. Um, is there a story if you had to recommend, or uh, well, at least for tonight, what's a story that you might recommend as a gateway, as a, a starting point that for a reader who wanted to uh, to take to take a, a gander at, at some of your, your work? Um, I would. Pr the th I think the story that I'm most proud of. Gosh, it would be a toss up between the story Layover, which appeared in Zombie Pirate Publishing's collection, Full Metal Horror. It was a cosmic horror collection, which I had never written before. And um, it'll appear actually in my next collection. But I I, I just, I loved writing it. I, um, I think I'm the proudest of it. But as far as anything else, um, I, I, I'm really proud of Shagging the Boss. I, I, you know, it was one of those things where I just, it was something that I, that was very different and I loved writing it. So yeah, that's it. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Shagging the Boss is great. And uh, Layover sounds intriguing. Uh, full, full metal horror and cosmic horror. I mean, yeah. without spoiling it, can you, can you tell us just a bit uh, what our appetite about that short story? Right, so it opens with this, the protagonist's name is Adam, and he start, he gets this odd postcard in his, like, when he's sorting through his junk mail, and he gets this odd postcard, and it's of this place that he's never been to, and on the back it just says, it was all your fault. And he kind of like, uh, this is obviously misaddressed. And then in the middle of the night, he gets a strange phone call, and he answers it, and it's just a person screaming. And then... Whoa sort of these odd prophetic messages keep happening, happening, happening. And it's not until the very end that you can kind of put together what um, what it was prophesizing for, for what his future would, would behold. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm really proud of it. It's, it's one of these weird stories that I, I actually had a nightmare. I had a nightmare about the entire story, got up, oh, wow. immediately wrote down everything I could remember, just everything, everything, everything. And two weeks later, went back, looked at my notes. Some of it made absolutely no sense, um, but I tried to kind of figure out what I was seeing and then I, I put it back together. But it, it's the one story that I think came out sort of fully formed. Um, I don't know where it came from. I don't, I usually write, wow female protagonists and it, this was a male it was just so i just got lucky on this one i think wow yeah. i mean i can relate to the part about having a dream writing it down and looking at it and making no sense i definitely relate to that <laughs> sure. uh that happens to me a lot like sometimes i wonder if it's even english but no but that's really it is really fascinating to me that um that it came almost fully formed in a dream um to Two of my favorite authors that I can't go five minutes without talking about on a broadcast, um, uh, Robert Aikman and Tanith Lee, both, you know, it, it, it dovetails both with that. Um, reportedly, Aikman, uh, from what I've heard secondhand, is uh, he was very reluctant to talk, talk at all. He would not talk at all about his uh, process, but those who were close to him had taken guesses that uh, a lot of it supposedly came like, as you said, it came from his dreams and in that process. And uh, and Tenneth Lee was known to um, to write from her dreams or write uh, even even a, a channeling in a channeling way. So that's it's super exciting, and uh, I'm super jealous. Maybe someday I will I will remember my dream or get to write in the way my heroes do, like you there. So that's really excellent. Who are some of your um, I, you know you know so much about horror. What are who are some of your early early influences? Like when you're just I mean, starting it as a reader. I know it's trite, but I mean, I, it was. I mean, it was Stephen King. I grew up in the '70s and '80s, and and my dad was a huge Stephen King fan, and um, for some reason, just did not keep them away from me, even though I was probably way too young to be reading them. Mm -hmm. And 
And then from there, I think it, it just sort of springboarded into, you know, Clive Barker and, and, and mm. a lot of mainstream horror. And it really wasn't until mm. I was in my 30s and 40s that I started reading the dark fiction of Joyce Carol Oates, which I, I just can't get enough of. I absolutely love her stuff. Um, things that are more sort of transgressive, that not are, are sort of straight horror, but more just sort of dark, like A.M. Holmes, um, even Tom Parada. You know, I, I just that's I just eat them up anytime they come out with something new. I I, I just I have to read it. Yeah. I'm going to ask you more about that, but I, I must back it up to say, I do not think uh, Stephen King, uh, being influenced by Stephen King is trite, not one bit. And your path sounded very, very, very similar to me. I'm going to turn, I have Gwendolyn muted, but um, you know, you're totally welcome to comment. I mean, how can we not comment on Stephen King there? But um, yeah, I, that, that path of going from King to Barker. And then, yeah, I didn't, I didn't start getting into more kinds of speculative fiction until I was uh, that those same eighth grade. So your, your path sounds really, um, mm -hmm. really important to mind. Is there a King story that stands out? Is there yeah. any one I, King story? King I'm so glad you're asking this because I just listened to Gwendolyn on a different podcast and she brought <laughs> up my favorite, my favorite King story of all time. And it's the boogeyman. So and, cool. um, uh, yeah. so it actually, it affected me so severely that I can remember being a freshman in college and saying to my roommate, no, the, the closet door, it needs to be closed all the way. You don't understand. It cannot be a little bit open. Um, it's still to this day, I really can't have a closet door a little bit open. I mean, it, it was just such a terrifying story. Thanks, it, Uncle Steve. Yeah, right, right. It, it, it's such a scary story. Like I, you know, I think about it and like there's that great part where they like move and then like slowly it moves to find them. And, like I think about that sometimes, this idea of like, because a lot of times in horror, like it, it'll just follow you wherever immediately or it won't follow you. But this idea of this monster, like even once they move, it slowly is like creeping its way and it's like, oh, Oh, that's terrible. It's yeah. like this monster is like not going to get there right away, but I'm coming. And it's like, right. wow, that is. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that story. I love Night Shift and Skeleton Crew. Those were two amazing influences on me before I even knew I was being influenced. The Boogeyman has a particular part in my history because I think it was the first time I felt the earth crushing pain of someone spoiling something for me. One of my buddies had the, the oh. bad sense of like spoiling the ending of that to oh. me. And I was like, yeah. no, until like this, to this day, I still, I don't quite harbor a grudge, but I still feel that the scars and the pain of that yeah. was spoiled. For the the very time. last scene or something else like that, that twist at the very end or something earlier in the story? I don't remember, I, I remember the twist and I don't, you know, I'm not even gonna say it just to not, to maybe not even spoil it for someone, but it was someone who was like, oh, I think it was the ending is this or the killer is this and like mm -hmm. my friend said it to me out of just sheer young sheer young male uh, arrogance he knew not what he was doing just uh just uh just the you know luckily i think that was maybe the worst thing that ever happened to me with my friends so that, that would be <laughs> <laughs> that would be okay um rebecca i want to ask you you mentioned um you mentioned transgressive horror and mm -hmm. um yeah, and you mentioned you mentioned a couple of names. That that's um, that's that's a subdivision I, I'm I'm not yet experienced. And yeah, maybe tell us a little bit more about uh, categorically uh, what transgressive horror is. You know what it, and what it means to you and how it influences you. Right. So I mean, with I mean, I guess with any fiction, we want to identify with with the protagonist. Um, but with transgressive fiction, the protagonist generally goes against the rules of society. So it's we almost we want to go along with him and her, her him or her but it's uh, they're often really bad people i mean i guess the best all-time example of transgressive fiction would be american psycho um mm, by okay. easton ellis right so even though we're kind of following him along um and he's doing these really horrific things um you know a part of us and maybe I'm alone on this, I don't know. We're kind of like, we hope he gets away with it. Like, we hope he gets away with yeah. it. We're kind of happy, like, when he gets interviewed and he gets mistaken, you know, they, you know, mistake the other yuppies 
um, for him. And, and it's just, so um, I think my best example of a transgressive horror story would be, uh, it was a piece I wrote called Bent. And it was about this uh, man who worked as a nurse who also had this fetish for tying up his, his, par his sexual partners. But it becomes, it kind of snowballs into this where he is turning them into these really horrific tableaus. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, at, and first you really, it's told in first person. So I try to present it as you like him, you, you, you find him charming. And then as he gets a little bit more and more depraved, uh, I'm hoping that the reader kind of looks at it and thinks, oh my God, like, what am I, what am I cheering for? And what, you know, where do you want him to go in the very end? Mm. That's so cool that I learned that definition because um, I think it's fascinating to think about it, like in terms of, in terms of structure or in terms of character, what we can present. Um, I once heard Kelly Link uh, speak and one, one of the things she said was, she was just asking the audience, like, what is it that you, she was talking about the same topic you did, uh, identifying with, with the character. And she said, well, what, what are the things that audiences or people identify with their characters? And she wasn't phrasing it in terms of good or evil. She, one, of the, one of the things that came up was character, uh, people, sometimes people like to read stories about people who are the best at what they do. Or, or who are incredibly skilled at what they do. So when you mentioned, oh, you have this 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 criminal, but you you want him to get away with it, I think I think she she really tapped into something like, oh yeah, we're we're it's transgressive because yeah, it's not like we're we're empathizing with it, but maybe it's like it's like it's like watching true crime or watching a train wreck or, mm -hmm. or watching, you know, oh we want you to get away with it because um, it's so fascinating that way. Um, mm -hmm. I think you know, sometimes when I was a younger writer, I, I struggled struggled about. I I phrase it in terms of of sympathetic characters. Like, oh, is it is it okay to write an unsympathetic character? What what are the risks of writing an unsympathetic character? Right. And I think the risk is, yeah, you you might you might simply lose your readership or exclude um, the readership. I always thought of it in terms of. Um, I guess I get I tend to get focused on structure and expectation. Like I think. What's, what's exciting? I have my I have the new word. I can call it. I have a new word for a thing now. I can call it transgressive. You know, because you can um, when you're writing transgressive, or or you can you can play with you can do just what you said. You can play with those readers' expectations. But like in the end, um, they're like, oh, what what did I just do? I, th I think um, this might be a trite a trite example of it. But the two in pop culture, the two uh, at least definitionally, I I'm thinking of Tony Soprano and Walter White. You know, these are yes. two. These are two people. Yeah. We're fascinated. Can't stop watching them. But if you really stop to think about it, you know, at the end, you're like, wait, wait a minute. I, I'm not. Sh at some point, I'm not sure when it happened, but I'm not voting for the good guy anymore. You know, right. and that's a, well. Hey, we're we're horror writers. That's just fun. That's just what we do. But it, it's also interesting to think about it psychologically and structurally. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because they're not they're not anti heroes, right? Because their, their goal isn't as, even yeah. though maybe in the beginning, it may have seemed yeah. like, you know, something that was, that was knowable, but then it becomes something else, you know, they're for sure. Yeah. Um, other, um, you mentioned in the, you mentioned a bunch of, uh, you know, psychological, uh, is your main, your, your main wheelhouse. What are, mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the other, uh, if you could repeat it, uh, what are some of the other wheelhouses that you, you're interested in or you dip your foot in uh, besides psychological and uh, transgressive? Yeah, every once in a while, I'll, I'll, I'll want to kind of veer into feminist horror, and it wasn't something that I ever thought that I would start writing. Um, even when I, I first started releasing things under my name, I didn't want to use the the, my first name, Rebecca, because I thought, oh, you know, people are going to think, oh, you know, women write this certain way and they're going to have these expectations. And so originally I went with just my initials and then I thought, you know, screw it. Like, I'm just, who cares what they think? I'm just going to use my name and yeah. it is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but every once in a while, something will strike me where I think, you know, I, I want to write about this. I want to write about, this is important to me. Um, 
and so every yeah i would say feminist for here and there yeah well, I, yeah I'm, I'm glad i'm glad you're doing that I, I know there's there's a lot longer to go but you know um you know i mentioned i'm a tannic lee fan and you know i studied or you know i was not around in the early 70s when she was publishing but you know like uh i'm glad things are at least moving in a different direction like in, in those days you would have an anthology and it's 90 percent white you know middle-aged old white guys and maybe tanith lee was the token female and maybe you had a token minority in there and um uh okay right like you know there's there's still great stories in there but we were just we we're missing we were missing out on so much and you know and an author like you know i'm always just preaching the tanith lee here like she just publishing never had a place for her you know they were always misplacing her we never had a place, and it's just so great that we're, we're um, we've made progress. That we're in a place now that um, both of your stories and um, just the wide range, like horror, horror when it's operating at its best, has room for all of this, and it's just great. You know, I'll, I'll, a rare in these in these rough these are rough times, but you know, I'll have a rare beam of optimism that you know, at least um, at least I'm happy to see the shifts um, the shifts that we made. Um, you also mentioned uh, you also mentioned creature horror. Do you, um, I just love I love uh, I love calling them by um, <laughs> categories like that. <laughs> yeah. What are what are some creatures that that strike your fancy that you've either put in some of your stories or or you'd like to put in your stories? Um, gosh, so I I did write a Wendigo story uh, early mm -hmm. early on, um, and because I just find that myth to be fascinating, just fascinating, fascinating. And this whole idea of, of the cannibalism of, of it, um, sort of the gluttony that's associated with it, the greed and all, everything about it, I find creepy and weird and, and fascinating. Um, and boogeyman characters, like, I, I mean, obviously the King thing apparently just imprinted on me. Um, yeah. But I, I read this article about boogeymen from around the, the world and oh, just, wow. It, just some of these creatures that are from different cultures, it, it's, they are terrifying. Like as Americans, I feel like we're actually, we're, we're pretty tame compared to some of the stuff yeah. that goes on. We've just yeah. got the shadowy shape in the closet, you know, like right. other cultures have got feet in the wrong direction, heads that fly off at night. I mean, they, yeah. they've, yeah. uh, they've had yeah. a lot of time to think about it. <laughs> yeah, coats made of like, children's skin like all sorts of like creepy creepy mm -hmm. stuff um so yeah i would say yeah boogeyman um yeah i that, that's pretty much with, with creatures they just fascinate me i i just think it's just fascinating where especially mm -hmm. things that have just sort of been passed down you know from generation yeah. to generation i think is really they're really neat yeah. um, i mean i've always known of the wendigo but I, i'm I'm a newcomer to having it in the fiction. I just read um, over the past year, um, uh, Brenda Tolian has a Wendigo adjacent story that is just absolutely, um, uh, and has a, has a cannibalism aspect to it that it, if it's not on your radar yet, I think it might, might be of interest. She's a wonderful writer as well. Um, um, we were talking about some weird. Uh, it's summertime. It's I don't know about by you. It's it's hot. Uh, summer getaways. We were talking about weird animal stories before we came on. But the other the other, uh, it, I, I'm afraid to go down that rabbit hole because like uncrossing your eyes, I'll never exit if I talk about weird animal stories. But the other thing that we do in the summer, um, summer movies. Um, are there what are there any summer horror movies that are on your radar or? If you're not back in cinemas like me, um, what are what are some some horror films uh, that have your attention? I just can't resist to that, but ask. I I did see Black Phone. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge Joe Hill fan, you know. Um, Same. And it was really well done. I I I have to admit, I went to go see, and it was really more of just a, hey, I want to get out of the house kind of a deal. I went to see Bodies, 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 um, and it was. It, you know, it was kind of fun. It was it was more of a satire, more of a sort of a, a horror comedy. Um, okay. I am excited to see the new Hellraiser when it is released. Oh yeah. I think that's going to be really soon. neat. It's coming pretty soon. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, but I can't, you know, I, 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 I don't know. What is coming out? Is there anything coming out soon? I'm, I'm kind of, I was asked, I was kind of hoping to get in the know on that. I guess the one that I, I did see was, uh, I did see Nope, uh, Jordan Peele, Jordan Peele's Nope. So I'm, I'm a Jordan okay. Peele fan. So that's definitely a no spoiler one, but you know, I can, if you like Jordan Peele, definitely see it. If you don't like Jordan Peele, then just get your head together and go see it anyway. You know, you need to, you need to do that. Um, so uh, your your most recent one, sh let's talk about Shagging the Boss. Um, okay. What was, what was the inspiration for this, um, for this story? Um, it was twofold. It was actually, it was sort of that, that rabbit hole of, of the boogeyman from around the world because the boogeyman in this story is an Aboriginal mythology boogeyman, a Yarmayahu, and who is his story. So in the traditional myth, unlike sort of boogeymen that are just sort of waiting in the shadows, he just hangs out like in his forest. And anyone that comes trace, you know, tra uh, sort of ro walking by just happens to just be like, oh, you know, I'm going through your forest. He jumps on them and then his mouth elongates to the point where he can swallow his victim whole and then he regurgitates the, the victim. And so it's up to the victim to then get up and run away because if you don't run away fast enough, he tackles you again and continues to consume you, regurgitate in this weird cycle. But every time he he throws up his victim, the victim retains a little bit of the Yaramayahu until it becomes a boogeyman as well. So it has that sort of vampire aspect to it that I thought was so neat and so creepy um, that I just researched everything I could about this particular boogeyman. And then I made him a press owner for, in Boston. Yeah. And so that's essentially what Shagging the Boss is about, is about this, this boogeyman that owns um, a press. Wow, that, I mean, that's such, an, that's such an amazing piece of folklore, a piece of lore <laughs> right there. And I, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm inspired just hearing it right there. I was going to yeah. ask you to set up. I was going to ask you to set up uh, what you're going to read, but okay. um, that sounds like a great setup. So I'm, I'm going to I'm going to turn the screen over to you, and okay. we're going to hear some from Shagging the Boss. Okay. okay. All right. So this is from right at the beginning. Um, it's not enough to be smart, or bloody gorgeous, or dirty rich. You need to be at least two simultaneously all three if you're over 30. That's what my employer Daniel told me one evening while we were sitting in a bone dry hot tub, him smoking a bowl full of vanilla Cavendish, both of us still wearing our clothes from the dinner party. I loved the way he said the words dirty and 30, his Brisbane accent slicing the ends of the R's and holding them up in the air between two fingers. He frowned, as if disagreeing with an unseen quarreler, then looked at me. How old are you again? He asked. 23, I said, stretching my arms behind my head in an exaggerated yawn. Too old to shag, he said, a funny half smile on his face. Sorry, I asked. We used to visit my cousins in Canada every Christmas, Daniel said. If they had a snow, they'd drag us out to the main street, sneak over to a car stopped at a traffic light and grab hold of the bumper. When the car began to move, they'd be pulled along with it like Santa on his sleigh. He relit the end of his pipe and inhaled deeply. Called it shagging, he added. His breath held tight within his lungs and his voice halted and miserly. He tucked his fingers in between the third and fourth buttons of his dress shirt and rested them there, his hand hiding its top like an ostrich. Daniel's shoulders were broad, Paul Bunyan broad, but his belly was swollen and round like a woman a short season away from giving birth. I can do that, I said, smiling with my lips pursed tight. Daniel blew a thick cloud of smoke at me and I steeled myself to keep from coughing uncontrollably. I'll bet you could, my ingenue. 
He removed his hand from his shirt, grabbed my arm, and unbuttoned the cuff of my shirt, then pushed it roughly past my elbow. Predatorily, he ran a finger along the center. I jerked my arm away and pushed the sleeve down. Seems like it would be fun, I added. Daniel smiled, but it was not the kind for an expression of happiness or even bemusement. His eyes glazed over into round black marbles before his hand snatched my arm again and wrenched it painfully toward his open mouth, his thick red tongue running back and forth along his teeth, trying to dislodge them. I closed my eyes and felt his hot breath just below the crook of my elbow, a splotch of drip saliva wetting the fabric there. Daniel taught me everything I know about publishing. My parents named me after a city they fell in love with the year after they graduated college, the nine months they spent backpacking around the United States instead of submitting the first payments on their student loans. We should have named you Naviant instead, my mother re remarked my senior year of high school as I completed my financial aid application. Christ, we've had a longer relationship with them than just about anyone. I have two siblings, one older and the other younger. Fortunately for me, each of us has one of those gender neutral city names, the kind that makes teachers bend their voices into question marks when they read it for roll call on the first day of school. My parents were those progressive Gen Xers who painted their children's bedrooms in green and yellow hues and filled the toy box with equal shares of dolls and dump trucks. I often joked with as many times as they folded their arms into pretzels, patting their own backs about it, they should have bought stock in Ben Gay. My mother always rolled her eyes when I said this. My dad simply ignored my criticism and tuned out my snark by turning up Pearl Jam or Soundgarden or whatever unwashed guitar -y goth music was playing in our house at the time. He died of a massive heart attack on their way to see me collect my diploma for a master's degree in English. My mother told me it happened during the first or second hour of the flight. Fortunately, none of us are named Albany, Toledo, or Chicago. When I had boarded the same airline two years previous, I thought I would never see the Boston suburb of my childhood again. Not unless it was Thanksgiving or maybe a wedding or a funeral. Mom's three children lived scattered around the country, but she refused to sell the three-floor Victorian in West Medford after Dad's sudden departure. And while I hated being a stereotype, I found myself lugging my belongings back into my parents' cavernous home after graduate school, leaving most of my networked Northern California connections 3,085 miles away. As I dragged my steamer trunk of books up the wooden stairs and onto the broad front porch, I told myself it was just temporary. A change of scenery required only until my flummoxed parent was back on her feet. But uh, one moment after I arrived, mom stopped going to work. She stopped going to her beloved book club. She stopped going to the supermarket. A month after that, she stopped going to the washing machine in the basement or to the shower in the bathroom of the top floor master suite. My love, she said, her voice businesslike on the phone, the house is yours. I'm just gonna birth a masonet for a few years if you don't mind. I pulled the cell from my ear and stared at the screen, listening for her voice's echo from two floors above. She hung up ordered a microwave, coffee maker, and a rudimentary set of dishes and cups from Amazon, and never came downstairs again, at least not while I was home. I set up shop in the small back den off the kitchen, the two of us making an unspoken agreement to leave the second floor vacant, my childhood home now a sandwich of empty calories. Each morning I called my mother to ask how she was doing. I'm getting on, is all she would say. That and, have you uncovered any of my missing earrings? She was referring to the shag carpet 
in the stuffy front living room, its strands measuring nearly two inches in length so that when I walked across it, my feet sunk down to be smothered in its quicksand of blue yarn tentacles. Over the years, paper clips, Lego bricks, and even a matchbox car or two had disappeared within its depths. My mother's earrings and occasionally a delicate necklace or two fellow victims. The items only resurfacing when mom rented an industrial carpet cleaner. Not yet, I always replied, though much of that was from lack of trying. The time I spent in the front living room was limited at best. And at the time of the Riley Book Fair, nothing had been unearthed from the plush piles of carpet. Not yet. Fantastic reading, fantastic reading. That was so everyone that was from, oh, we get it centered on camera. That was from Shagging the Boss by Rebecca Rowland. Rebecca, where's the best place people can connect uh, connect with this book and get themselves a copy to, to, to hear the rest of it? I mean, it's everywhere, but I can tell you that filthyloot.com, so the publisher's website um, is a fantastic place to get it because not only will he send you the book, but he has a ton of swag that he mm -hmm. always sends. And um, Filthy Loot is known for their transgressive and weird horror. So if you are a fan of that, definitely check them out, filthyloot.com. Filthy, filthyloot.com. And okay. your favorite, if not that, your favorite bookseller. Anywhere else, for sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep your mic on. Cause I know that I know that you've had a chance to check out reluctant immortal. So when, when as we move on to the second part of the show, uh, please feel free to, um, to jump in or, um, you know, uh, add in on, on anything that's going on. So I just want to welcome our, our listeners out there to the, to the second part of the show. Um, just had a chance to hear from Rebecca Rollins and, uh, she, uh, she read from shagging the boss. And we had a chance to talk with her. And in the next part of the show, um, we're going to talk with Gwendolyn Keis. And her her new book is Reluctant Immortals. It's a, it's a wonderful cover. It's a wonderful book. I'm jealous that I don't have filters. I can't. I wish I had the Reluctant Immortals filter where I, where I could turn we three into uh, <laughs> into into the colors and and psychedelic covers on the book there, but. <laughs> But we just have our fingers crossed that we're uh, that we're with you. The, the power of the internet that we're with you here at all. So well, well, welcome, Gwendolyn. Uh, congratulations, congratulations on the book. Um, how's the launch week going for you? Good, busy, very busy. I, I'm sure everybody who follows my social media is probably tired of hearing about it by now, but I'm just going to keep on posting about it because I'm very excited. Well, <laughs> well, let's substitute tired for excited. That's 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 where I'm I'm, I'm landing on this one. Uh, I'm just excited. Uh, I'm I'm not going to get tired of it. I'm excited to see to see and, and hear and hear all about it. Um, I want to jump. I want to jump right in. Um, I want to read a short little excerpt uh, from it before I ask you my first question. Um, so here's a little bit from the book. Of course, I never want to spend my nights with him, but what I want doesn't count for much. So the narrator of the story is Lucy Wisterna, who's living in Hollywood in 1967, the summer of love. Uh, mm -hmm. Dracula has been vanquished and his ashes are kept separated in a mm -hmm. series of urns that Lucy stands guard over day and night to prevent them from reforming into Dracula. So yeah. here's another bit that follows. Please, as if men like him are ever that easy to vanquish, they always figure out the best way around the rules, bending the world in their favor. For most of us, death is the undeniable end. For him, it's only a minor inconvenience. So from the start of this book, it's apparent that this is not only the story of Lucy and Dracula. It, it also is operating, and at least to this reader, it's operating and, and can be read as a story of, of every man and woman who's ever wronged or hurt uh, or oppressed each other. Um, mm -hmm. And the, 
the way that women are treated in this world is one that um, it, it's never far from the surface in any of your work. So I found this one really, it was really well done. The way the story operates as just a really fast paced, really skillful, fun read on the surface, but it also had a lot, a lot um, larger and more exciting things happening as well. So um, let's, let's talk, this is, and this is a theme that, you know, it's, it's in your short story collection, it's in your work. Um, what is about, let's talk about the theme as you see it in Reluctant Immortals. Yeah, yeah, so the story is both Lucy from Dracula and then Bertha Antoinette Mason, the mad woman in the attic from Jane Eyre, and they are the reluctant immortals of the title, and they're hiding out really from their past, from the men that, that did this to them in 1967 California, like you said. And so to me, it really is a story of people who have been forgotten, people who've had their story deleted or ignored, and really just about them figuring out how to reclaim that story and how, how to say, hey, I am here and there is a different perspective on this rather than just, you know, Dracula and Edward Rochester being just romantic and, you know, these romantic characters, they're like, mm -mm, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, and I think you even have, I remember there is that passage where you talk about B, talk about Bertha, and yeah. how her this is how this is how her story's been presented. Mm -hmm. And this is how she's always had to kind of, you know, be represented. And that's mm -hmm. that's so unfair because yeah. you know, this is her. This is who and we get to know her, which mm -hmm. is I that was probably my my favorite part of the book is just following Bertha's story. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I loved it. And I wanted to cheer for her. It was kind of like yeah, she kind of got got twisted and put yeah. into this box, right? Um, yeah. Even by Bronte herself, and and yet, you know, this is you you sort of made her flesh, and I love it. I love it. Thank you, thank you, um, Gwendolyn. Your story, the eight people who murdered me, yes. excerpt from Lucy Westerner's diary, um, that appears in in issue eighty six of Nightmare Magazine. Um, did the short story and the idea for the novel *Reluctant Immortals* uh, come at the same time, or when? If not, when did uh, when did you know that this tale was going to be something that you had to write? Yeah, really, the short story definitely came first, and it was actually the morning when the short story came out at Nightmare and was released online. I remember getting up, and I was so excited because I knew a lot of people. You know, Nightmare when they go live on Nightmare, you know, you're gonna have a at least a few people reading it. Unfortunately, a number of people did. So I was very excited because it's available for free online. But I remember the morning I woke up, I was so excited. But at the same time, I felt like, oh, now I'm going to have to start saying goodbye to Lucy. Like, you know, the, the story's coming out now. And once the story's out, like you let you let it have its time. But then that's it. And I'm like, but I don't want to let her go yet. Like, I, I love the character. And I, you know, I, I really want, I enjoyed so much writing the short story and establishing her voice. And I'm like, I, I remember where I was standing in my bedroom, like getting up that morning and being like, I want to, I want to write more. And I'm like, well, I could write a novel about her, but I'm like, I didn't want it to just be Lucy because I felt like I had just done that with the short story and I knew I wanted to take it in a different direction. And then I just thought of Bertha from Jane Eyre and, you know, I had done some variation with her in a previous story as well. And so I was like, how about them being together? Like, how about them being friends? Like, what would they say if they were hanging out about these guys? Like, hey, this isn't cool. And like, how would they feel about that? And really, that was just like the moment it, it, it started. And I, at first, I'm like, I don't know. And then I'm like, and like, when would I set it? And I knew I didn't want to set it in Victorian times because the short story had been set during that time. And I knew I wanted to do something different. And right away, I'm like, oh, the 1960s, it was such a time of like social change. So if they're really going to experience that kind of change and this would be a perfect time for it. And then I'm like, wow, so Lucy from Dracula, Bertha from Jane Eyre in 1960s, like California. I'm like, I don't know that anybody would read that. I'm like, but I would totally want to read that. So I'm like, hmm. And so when my mm. editor from Saga approached me, I'm like, well, I've got this idea. And I'm thinking like, this is like totally like out there. And he's like, all right, you, you know, let's do it. I'm like, all right, let's do it. And that's, 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 one, it that's one way to not have to let go to to avoid the, the 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 tragedy of letting go. It's like, well, you're becoming you're becoming a novel. Um and I'm glad yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned you mentioned the setting because I absolutely adore the setting. I think it's totally meant to be. Um 
here's this one line of setting I, I, I want to read. And forgive me, because I can't resist from reading these, these wonderful little lines. Um, this is a glittering city haunted by the ghosts of dead girls and dead dreams. In that way, B and I fit right in. So yeah, like the the um, the summer of love and um, the details of the summer of love, like um, uh, Cape Canaveral. We have the Mariner Five launch. We have yeah. the yeah. James Bond, the appropriate James Bond movies. Um, there's yeah. there's so much resonance in the setting happening. Um, uh, yeah, why why um, let's talk about that resonance. What? What specifically, when did it just solidify for you and you were like, I'm absolutely, this is meant to be in the summer of love. Besides the fact, that, you know, you just you just love that period of Hollywood. I know that you're a fan of it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love Hollywood and then I love San Francisco. And what was so interesting about it is 1967 in each of those cities was similar yet different. And so it was like, it was a very interesting experience because the, the book starts in Los Angeles then moves to San Francisco uh, about a, about a third and quarter, and third the way through, and that was a really interesting experience researching it because it was like they were similar, but there were so many differences. You know, you do have Hollywood; it was in a kind of a little bit, bit of a state of decay. We talked about this elsewhere, but like the Hollywood sign was literally falling down. That's where the book starts is at the Hollywood sign, and it mm. was falling down at that point. It was falling down for like another ten years. I like double checked this this week just to see. 1978 is when they rebuilt it and like completely rebuilt it. Like I think they had to tear it completely down and rebuild it because it was just like flap it in the breeze because it was never supposed to last to begin with. And that's what's interesting about Hollywood when you think about it is like a lot of this stuff isn't meant to last. It's sets or the Hollywood sign was like a promo piece. And then it's like a lot of that has lasted a lot longer than I think when they originally went in. It was like, oh, this is, you know, this is just going to be this industry. And they didn't realize, you know, like over 100 years later, this is like such a centerpiece of, you know, California economy. And so that felt so gothic to me. And as I was developing it, I'm like, this is, Hollywood is such a gothic place. We often don't think of California as being gothic because we see it as bright and sunshiny. And it's like, it's very gothic. And then going to San Francisco, there was a lot of like decay there as well. And I, I think I feel like I've talked about this elsewhere, but like part of the reason all the kids were able to move in to hate Ashbury is because the the you know housing was kind of run down. And so it was very cheap. So all these kids could move in. And I, I just laughed, you know, I ruefully in some ways, because like it's not cheap to live in San Francisco no. now. We cannot fathom kids being able to just like move in like oh it's so cheap in san francisco let's all go spend the summer there like that's like completely not 2022 at all but like in that summer it was very run down in a lot of these places and so you know they were able to move in but at the same time you've also got that gothic feel to to the summer of love in a lot of ways and i i read some of joan didion's essays about the summer of love and she was very cynical about it joan didion was very cynical about the summer of love but what was interesting about it is some of the things she was kind of observing felt very gothic like it is run down it's kind of creepy it's kind of weird you know you got a lot of transient people and so it, it was it was interesting because you know reading even other people's takes on it, it it had a gothic feel to it so i'm like yeah like this is i haven't seen a lot there is some california gothic certainly but i i feel like i'm like i feel like i can do some interesting things here that i don't see done very often so it was definitely like all right let's do this let's let's explore this from like this very goth classic gothic i mean i feel like jane Eyre and dracula are two of like you know very classic literature gothic stories so it's like let's look at this from a very kind of different perspective, but yet at the same time, a perspective that's more similar than you might initially think because it is so traditionally Gothic in a lot of ways. Well, yeah, you definitely, you definitely succeeded. Uh, I'm so glad you talked about the Gothic aspect to it because yeah, you definitely succeeded in giving, giving us that California 67. Uh, <laughs> not that I would know I wasn't there, but I, I did spend some time in California and I love what you got, <laughs> I'm going to excuse my invented words here. I love what you gothicized and I love what you de-gothicized and Ooh. it's more than a surface level. So let me, let me say what I'm talking about here. Uh, it's summed up perfectly in an, another one of your great lines. And it's, you're, it's, you're talking about Count Dracula himself right here. The night it happened, 
There was no black cape or black hat or blood clotting Technicolor red across a crisp white blouse. It was far duller than that. Just me and him on an iron park bench at midnight, my broken curfew, his broken promise, a man who takes what he wants and a girl who has to pay the price. That's the way these stories always go. That's just like one bit of a thread of de-romanticizing, de-gothicizing Dracula and shifting the story and shifting that Technicolor red uh, onto Lucy and B. And I just love that. I just love the, like that is done effortlessly. Um, so it's like it's like we're getting we're still getting Dracula. Like we love oh, hey, he's a great, he's a great boogeyman, he's a great villain. We love Dracula, but we're not getting him through the romanticized gaze that erased Lucy's story. And that is just that's just spectacular. Um so yeah, can can you talk about these portrayals in terms of the gender dynamics and the dynamics yeah. of power and uh, some of the abuses in power that often come with that. Yeah, absolutely. And that that line, the lines you just read, when I was writing it like that is what I was very much trying to do. Like we do think of it as being romantic so often and it's romanticized, you know, vampires bite and, and so much and, and in movies but we don't often see it from the perspective of the victim that's like this is just awful i hate this this is terrible this ruined my life you know and i did want to have this kind of feeling at times of making it more you know mundane and horrifying in a much more conventional way rather than it being like oh look it's supernatural and this is like so romantic it's like no this was awful like this was just terrible and it was you know, the, again, like his broken promise, she just felt like this was somebody who she could connect with. And it was like, no, that's not what this was at all. And looking at it through that kind of modern perspective of the way that we see these things more so now, or at least some of us see it now, obviously some people, you know. Uh, but yeah, it was something that I, I was really thinking about a lot as I was writing this of especially, you know, they've had so much time, both Lucy and B, to be like, this is awful. These guys are terrible and everybody's romanticizing them. This is horrible. And to really have that perspective of, you know, making it mundane to make it more real as, as to how somebody would feel like if this actually happened to them, because most of the time it is told from more of a male gaze and more of this perspective of, you know, how does it look, you know, for, for the, for the predator, you know, for the vampire or for the man in power. And it's like kind of shifting that back to the women and being like, no, this is just terrible. This is awful. We hate this. And really kind of bringing it down into those kind of more realistic terms as to how they feel was definitely something I was thinking about the entire time I was writing this. And I love that, like you saying, like de-gothicizing it. I, I hadn't even thought that that's exactly <laughs> what this does because that gothic element, you know, I, I was enhancing the gothic of so many things but i didn't think about how with stuff like this it was like kind of leeching the gothic out of it and saying no let's like take some of that you know romantic element out of it and let's just make it much more straightforward as to how somebody let's would take feel. the shine off of some of the awful stuff here yeah and and i love that you said the mundane and the realistic which is not a dirty word like th this book starts off you, you know um look there's nuance and layers but you don't you don't pull the punch at all in the very beginning these are tales about rochester and dracula mm -hmm. books and movies where b and i this is lucy talking where b and i have mostly been written out deleted from our very own story our own lives like that's 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 not a spoiler that's front front yeah. and center of the yeah. very first things you're going to read in this book mm -hmm. and um and it starts i love that you use the word mundane it starts with B and Lucy in their daily ritual, which is super cool. They like to go to a drive-in, uh, but you know they go to a drive-in, but they're also uh, dealing with the fragments uh, of Dracula. So it's it's a great, it's just a real great opener. Um, well, I also think I think by degothing, which I I'm now I'm going to adopt that that term now from now on. I love that you use that term. I think by doing that, Thank you can also read the book as an allegory of just any sort of misogyny or male control of women in general, really across the ages, not even using any sort of supernatural. And I just, I yeah. just, I, people I are going agree, to, Rebecca, it works. 
Yeah. It, it works. To, yeah, it works um, as their stories, but yeah, and an allegorical. It's so it's so rare and deft, and it's a hard trick to pull off to get it to do that. And for this reader, for sure, it, that, that's happening on all points. So like, that's a great point. Um, going back to to, to Bertha, um, uh, yeah. So she was written. She was written out of her own story. What what inspired you to um, to include her in this in this team up as well? You know, like I said, like I've I've always you know I've always been a fan of Dracula since I was very little. I mean, like five or six, probably. I don't even remember. I, and you know, I was a fan of Jane Eyre from the time I was like eleven, twelve, somewhere around there. And so, it just really growing up with both of these stories and knowing that each one of them had this character that I want. I just wanted to know more about them. You know, I wanted to know more about Lucy. I wanted to know more about Bertha. And you know, just thinking about that a lot over the years and how many, you know, every, so many stories have like female characters that I, I was always like, oh, and then they would get killed off or written out of the story or things like, oh, and it's like, there's like inner life there that you're like, well, what, what, what's there, you know, what's going on with them? What happened to them? You know, how, how would they feel about this? And I always loved stories that were taken from perspectives that, you know, weren't as well known. I mean, honestly, one of the first times I ever heard of it is I believe like years ago, uh, there was like a play, a stage play, um, of a, I think called Renfield. It was actually taken from Renfield's perspective of Dracula. And I remember thinking even as a kid how cool that was. And so, you know, that, that you know, this idea of like taking a side character and really giving it through, the, you know, through their perspective. Renfield does show up in Reluctant Immortals. He is an important supporting character because I love <laughs> Renfield too. And that was fun because like, Renfield and Lucy, I don't believe, are ever together in Dracula, yet they have very similar fates. They're, they actually are like parallel characters in a lot of ways. They're both very much innocent. They didn't do anything to, you know, cause what happened to them. And yet, you know, they both, spoiler alert for Dracula, you know, they both die. <laughs> and they're, um, you know, <laughs> die about midway through the books. Um, I think Renfield dies after Lucy does. But, you know, it it made me sad for both of them. And, you know, again, neither one of them, you know, intended any of this to happen and didn't do anything to deserve it. And so that was fun to actually put them together and see how they would feel about each other. And that was uh, what I, what I realized once I put them together in a scene is that that how would they talk to each other? You know, Dracula very much discards Renfield, you know, and, with Lucy, even in the original, they they kill Lucy. The men come and kill Lucy. Dracula doesn't. We don't really know whether or not he cares. We don't get that much of his perspective. But I thought, you know, in my version, you know, he and Lucy, Dracula and Lucy have this very toxic relationship. So then to bring Renfield in as this other discarded character who's kind of jealous of Lucy because Dracula is still paying attention to her and has completely discarded him. And so that that was an interesting way of kind of bringing in a side character for me. Like I was like, I didn't realize that's how they would feel till I'm like, well, okay, let's get them on the page together. How would they interact? And I'm like, Oh, Renfield would be jealous because like Renfield was so obsessed with Dracula and it's like now Dracula is obsessed with Lucy. So you're like, he's jealous of the person that is, you know, the person he's obsessed with is obsessed with. So it just seemed like, you know, having these characters and bringing them, you know, these side characters and bringing them in and giving them like that, that focus and taking things from their perspective was just so very appealing to me. And then, you know, I also bring in a little bit of a spoiler alert, both Mina from Dracula and Jane Eyre. And yet they're supporting characters. And I really wanted that to be something that they didn't, their narratives didn't overtake the story, but I still wanted them to be there and to kind of see you know what happened what's happened to them how has how have these men affected them you know when we left the stories jane is happy you know at the end of jane era with rochester despite the fact that he had a you know first wife in prison in the attic personally i'd be a little afraid you know how long until maybe he might imprison me but like that doesn't seem to be a concern of jane's in the original book it would be a concern of mine but okay um and then mina's you know happy at the end of of dracula you know they're they're sad about everything that's happened but you know they're, they're happy but i thought we end these stories at places where it's like it's easy to say, oh, everything's fine now. It's all fine. Thornfield burned down and, and Bertha is dead and he totally imprisoned his wife. And, you know, Dracula killed some of our friends, but we're good. But would you really be? You know, I always think that that's, 
to me, so many stories, I want to know what happens next, because sometimes I think we don't want to deal with the fallout and the emotional fallout that things would have. Mm -hmm. Like, if, if you really had to deal with Dracula and you had to, like, tra like chase him across, like, you know, Europe after he's killed your friend and all of this, like, you wouldn't be messed up from that. Like, nobody talked about PTSD back then, but everybody involved in chasing Dracula would presumably have had PTSD. And we don't talk about those things. And to me, that's so yeah. much interesting stories happen are those aftermath of how do we deal with having to live with this. It really is a book of our times in that way, you know, um, you know, you, we talk about like in action movies, oh, we don't see the consequences of, of, of mm -hmm. violence. And mm -hmm. it's sort of analogous in, in, in what you're talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you get to have that emotional fallout. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in, in addition to, um, you know, the book lends itself to the to the commentary, to the allegories and, and, to, and to just the, this fun way of re-entering the stories one of the things that's also super fun about the book is that um, it's the supernatural, just the, the way that you approach the supernatural. Um, Mr. Rochester uh, can call to be mm -hmm. uh, from where he is. Dracula, mm -hmm. Dracula can still tempt, uh, uh, can still tempt uh, Lucy, and you learn you learn different rules, like some you know the the sunlight thing that you have in your book and. Yeah. The fact that vampires can cause decay, and that's just super fun. So, so let's just talk about fun vampire and supernatural powers in general, <laughs> or ones that we can see in Reluctant Immortals. <laughs> you know, with Jane Eyre, what's interesting about it is it's not supernatural, yet it almost is because that you know Rochester calling from afar is something he actually does to Jane in Jane Eyre, like, or she imagines that he is. We're not really sure. Is it just in her head? But, you know, towards the end, she can hear him calling to her. And I always found that so interesting. And, like, I always felt that, that Jane Eyre was so close to being supernatural, yet never quite took the step, yet you could interpret it as being supernatural. And so it was just like, you know, as, as a gothic horror writer who loves the supernatural, when I was writing this book, I'm like, let's just go all in. Let's just take these, these like, suggestions of the supernatural and let's actually just bring that in as a huge part of the story and so that that was definitely where that came from with uh rochester calling from afar to be and then with vampires i knew i wanted to just like have some like you know take some elements that were in dracula and just like kind of play with them a little bit and one of the things i do find so interesting is that we have gotten into this mindset that with sunlight you know, I think most people would say that Dracula would have been killed by sunlight, but he wasn't. And in, in the original story, he's just not powerful during the day. He can't transform. He can't do a lot of the like wild stuff that Dracula can do. That's just at night. But he can go out. And that is one thing that the Coppola version did a really good job of in Bram Stoker's Dracula. He's like walking around like he's got his top hat on and he's like, you know, like hanging out with Mina Winona Ryder's character and so like I like that because that is like how he was in the in the original book is that he could go out during the day but just wasn't powerful and I feel like we've lost some of that and Lucy says that she says something like sunlight that wasn't one of the original rules we don't turn into you know ash but at the same time I, I was thinking okay like but they lose their power. Why is that? You know, what happens to them that they would? And so I decided to kind of play with that. And in Reluctant Immortals, they, uh, the sunlight acts as like this thing that kind of takes them into the past. I thought like how sunlight is always described as being very pure and, and good and everything. And I thought, how about if it affects them because, you know, they've got all this decay in them that it actually makes them remember the past. And so it's not that you know it'll kill him she won't turn to ash or anything but she'll be completely weakened by the fact that like all of a sudden she can start she has these again like ptsd flashbacks into everything that's happened to her as this way of taking away her power and so kind of playing with some of those ideas from you know classic vampire lore and everything and also the other thing that that you you brought up is the decay 
I've always loved that vampires are always living in these decayed places. I've just always thought that's just so cool. And as I went to write this, I'm like, well, what if they just make the decay? We always assume it's because <laughs> vampires live forever and they're just like, I'm like terrible housekeepers. Like I'm living forever. I'm not dusting. Are you kidding? Like I live forever. I'd be dusting every day. But I thought, what if they can't even help it? What if because they're they're dead and that decay is just kind of clinging to them, that death is clinging to them, and so in Reluctant Immortals, B and Lucy live in this big old Hollywood mansion and it just fills up with dust and cobwebs and slowly comes apart every day. And they have to keep fighting against this kind of entropy. And every day they have this like pattern and this routine that they have to go and clean up all the decay that's like coming down onto the house. And so that just sounds terrible. Like I always say um, immortality sounds like such a terrible thing to me. And so it just seems like, you know, that would be one more thing of like, no, I don't want to be immortal. Like it would just be all this decay, too much dusting. See, there it is. Like that, that's, that's it. That. Too much <laughs> dusting, too much housework. I'm not doing housework. That, mon that very <laughs> mundane thing, uh, yeah. which seems very <laughs> mundane, but it's where we find them. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's where we, we meet them in the beginning of the book I've, I've tried my best and i think i've done a good job to um to not put in any spoilers i was going to ask you about some hints but you've already covered some of the people we may see in the book so at that point so i think it's a great point for me just to set up to ask you um we're going to get to hear you read from it will you set up for yeah. us um what you're going to read and then i'm going to mute our mics and turn it over to you gwendolyn all right. Yeah, I'm just going to read from the beginning. It might cover a little bit of what we've already heard, but yeah, I'm just going to start in chapter All one. All right. Just pages from the beginning. Yeah. Let's take it away. All right. All right. So here, here it is. There it is. I'm, I'm very happy with the cover. So it's very colorful. I like bright colors. So as you can even see from the painting behind me. So starting right at the beginning. One. It's almost sundown in Los Angeles and Dracula's ashes won't shut up. He's been at it since yesterday, calling out for me, calling out for anyone, his voice strained and distant, so soft I can never quite make out the words, so unforgiving I can never escape him. I cover my ears and recite a prayer I no longer believe, but it's not enough to blot out the sound of him. I have to try something else. I have to bury him. Again. So now here I am, standing in the shadow of the Hollywood sign, a shovel in one hand, an urn of his ashes in the other. Up here on Mount Lee is as good a place as any to lay him to rest. It's remote and hard to get to, and at the very least, I won't forget where I put him. The last bits of daylight have dissolved across the horizon, and I move through the overgrown weeds, picking a spot between the letters Y and W, where the earth is soft and malleable. Then I start digging. Below me, the city buzzes pleasantly like a swarm of locusts. It's the middle of June, the heat creeping in, and this isn't how I wanted to spend my evening. Of course, I never want to spend my nights with him, but what I want doesn't count for much. As I work, the urn quivers on the earth next to me. The color of midnight, it's not much bigger than a man's fist. This isn't the only urn of Dracula's ashes, but right now, it's the only one that matters. It's the loudest of the bunch, that's for sure. The others back at the house are usually content to keep quiet, murmuring no louder than common sleepwalkers. But not this one. It's made up its mind to make my life hell, and I've made up my mind to do the same to him. Another whisper from the urn, and I nudge it with my heel. Stop, I say, my feet sinking in the mud. I hiked all the way up here in my pilgrim pumps and satin dress up the Santa Monica Mountains, even snagging my hem on a low-lying shrub. Dracula doesn't care. He just keeps at it. He's never been very good at keeping his mouth shut. Not that he's really got a mouth, not now, not after I buried that stake in his cold, dead heart. Anybody who knows the story, and let's face it, these days, who doesn't know the story, will always wonder the same thing. He's dead, right? Turned to dust decades ago? Shouldn't everyone be safe now? Please. As if men like him are ever that easy to vanquish. They always figure out the best way around the rules, bending the world in their favor. For most of us, death is the undeniable end. For him, it's only a minor inconvenience. A sharp breeze cuts through the dusk, rattling the letters in the sign like restless bones. The air, harsh and sweet, I close my eyes, the buzz of the city fading away. That's when I hear them. All the sweet heartbeats in Los Angeles thrumming inside me at once. They walked up from the valley like steam, and my skin hums, my teeth sharpening, reminding me of what I am, what he's done to me. The sound of Dracula rises again, almost singing now, and even though I still can't hear him clearly, I can guess what he's saying. 
Take what belongs to you, Lucy, he used to tell me. Take anything you want. I do my best not to listen. My hands blistered. I keep digging, promising myself the same thing as always, that I won't end up like him. I won't become a monster. I'd rather waste away, which is exactly what I'm doing. Hunger gnawing at me night after night, my stomach aching and cavernous and raw. It turns out a vampire can live a very long time without taking a drink. It just hurts like hell to do it. I grimace, eager to get this over with, as a shadow passes over my face. Are you all right? A voice materializing, then is missed next to me. I turn and see her, moving like a phantom in the twilight. So quiet, I never heard her coming. I smile. Hello, B. She grins back. Hello, yourself. The melody of the city fades to static, and it's just me and her in these ashes that won't ever rest. Her head down, B huddles close to me, and the hollowness, the silence within her, reminds me of how we're connected. There's no heartbeat inside either of us. We're at once alive and dead, even though we aren't the same. B's no vampire like me. She died and came back a different way, a way she doesn't like talking about. That means Dracula's not her problem. He's mine. So I try to keep her out of this. When I left, she was waiting in the car back where I parked it on the street in a quaint little neighborhood where the only boogeyman they know is rising inflation. You didn't have to come all the way up here, I say, digging a little faster now. Figured you could use the company, be fidgets in the dirt next to me. Besides, I'd rather not be alone. An uneasy silence twists between us. I'm not the only one with secrets. The Hollywood sign looms over us, the rusted sheet metal trembling in the breeze. For a lonesome town, this might be its most lonesome landmark. At the far end, the H rocks back and forth, the same letter actress Peg Entwistle chose when she took a swan dive off the sign back in 32. That was 35 years ago, ancient history in this town. And by now, everyone's mostly forgotten her. That's how it goes here. This is a glittering city haunted by the ghosts of dead girls and dead dreams. In that way, B and I fit right in. The shovel hits sandstone, and this is it, the best I can do. My hand's shaking, I deposit the urn of Dracula into the dark. There are no words of prayer and no curses either, just a flick of the wrist and he's nestled in the ground. I fill the hole back in, almost frenzied, my fingernails limbed with darkness, my pumps pounding on the earth, packing down the soil. B helps too, kicking some dirt into the grave. How long do you think he'll stay put? I shake my head. Not long. Beneath our feet, I already feel him, restless as always. He'll work his way back up, bit by bit, crawling like an earwig, the urn writhing in the earth on his command. I grind my heel into the ground one last time. Goodbye, I say. But he and I both know it's a lie. I'll come back at the end of the week. It isn't safe to leave him alone for long. At least this way, though, I get a few days reprieve from his complaining. It's darker now, and B and I trek back to the car. Halfway down the hill, she takes off her shoes, lemon yellow Mary Janes we picked up last year at the Salvation Army. Easier than hiking in heels, she says, and I laugh and do the same, the two of us barefoot in the trail dust, sneaking through the Santa Monica Mountains, dragging the shovel behind us. There are snakes in these parts, but they slither away beneath the sagebrush when they see us coming. We emerge at last under a streetlight, and parked on Mulholland is our Buick LeSabre, rust on the bumper, one tail light cracked. B tosses me the keys, and we both slide in. Gwendolyn is frozen right now. We're um Oh my god, and I was like so mesmerized by her reading too. So oh, oh, oh good. Well, good back. You're back. Yeah. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. I don't you're know. Back. We're just gonna turn it back over to you. These okay. things happen. Okay. okay. I'll do a few more away. minutes. <laughs> Please. All right. Uh, the car's already seven years past its prime, but who's counting? Not us. Not when we have less than $100 in cash to our names and can't afford a new ride. This is the only thing we've got, so we make the best of it. With the canvas top pulled down, we rocket toward the state highway, the California evening settling around us like a false promise. As the only ender trees rush past, B twists, in the, B twists the chrome dial on the radio, and we sit back, listening in. It's the same news as always, the death toll in Vietnam, the people in power pretending to care. Nothing good ever happens here. Cape Canaveral launched Mariner 5 at Venus this morning, which makes sense because the only way things might ever improve is to give up on this planet altogether. Do you think we could survive on Venus? B asks. I shrug. I hear it's made of fire. She exhales a laugh. Aren't we? B tips her head back, the wind rustling through her long, dark hair. The night's cooling off already, and the canopy of trees draws us closer into its embrace. I wish we were safe here, but we're not alone. We're never alone. Not really. 
Something's always whispering after us, lingering on the breeze, hiding in the static of the radio. I press the gas pedal harder, ready to rev it so fast nothing could ever catch us. But that's when I see it. The marquee emerging around the bend, the cornflower blue neon flashing like a beacon. Munro's drive-in. Double screens open seven days a week. Chock full of loud music, louder explosions, and images so bright they nearly blind us. This is exactly what B and I need. It's the only way we've found to escape ourselves, to escape the past, if only for a few hours. The engine turns over as we idle up to the ticket booth. It's faded paint flecking off like chunks of dirty snow. Inside, hunched over in a folded chair is Walter, the purveyor of the place. His hair fright white, thick whiskers coming out both his ears. He squints into the convertible and brightens when he sees it's us. Hello, girls, he says, flashing us a toothy grin, oblivious as always. B and I have been coming here for 10 years, neither one of us ever aging a day, but he doesn't seem to notice. He's just happy to have the patrons. We pay our $5 and rumble slowly into the lot over chunky gravel, pulling into the last spot in the front row. The speaker's the best one in the place. Never been broken, not that we know of, and you can crank the volume high enough to drown out almost anything. The first movie starts a minute later, barely long enough for us to turn off the engine. Walter must have been waiting for us. He knows we're here every night, rain or shine. Our eyes fixed on the screen, the trailers flash by, as B sits cross-legged in the passenger seat, her dusty pumps on the floor, her feet bare again. All around us, the scent of pick permeates the air, everybody with a mosquito coil lit on their dashboards except for us. B and I don't have to worry. We're in the only car the bugs never bother. They know there are no signs of life here. But there are signs of life elsewhere. Windows fogged up, heavy panting the whole nine yards. Young couples necking in the back seats of their parents' borrowed cars, their guards down, their pulses thrumming faster. My fingers clenched tight on the steering wheel, the soundtrack of the movie fading out, everything fading, until all I hear are those rhapsodic heartbeats. These eager lovers are easy pickings, too easy. They'd never expect me, what I'd do to them. I could stroll right up to their cars and climb on in, and they wouldn't even have time to open their mouths and scream before I'd open my mouths and make sure they never screamed again. Sometimes I think I like coming here just to test myself to prove I'm not a monster. I can sit right in the middle of a smorgasbord and I won't do a single thing about it. I look across the mountains in the dark and there it is hanging over me in the distance like the blade of a guillotine, the Hollywood sign. You can see it from all over town, peeking between buildings, shining through the smog. That means I can see him too, the place where I've hidden him. 70 years and what he did to me still feels as fresh as yesterday. Every detail branded into my mind, the scent of roses, the scent of him, sweet and inviting like a home I'd never known. The night it happened, there was no black cape or black bat or blood clotting technicolor red across a crisp white blouse. It was far duller than that. Just me and him on an iron park bench at midnight. My broken curfew, his broken promise. A man who takes what he wants and a girl who has to pay the price. That's the way these stories always go. The first movie ends and the floodlights come up for intermission. The couples in the other cars climb out and stretch their legs, their bodies glistening with sweat, fresh hickeys on their necks. I watch them, thinking how quick it would be, how simple. One pointed glance from me and they'd be under my sway, mine for the taking. Dracula's voice ripples through me again. Take what belongs to you, Lucy. As though in his command, I fling open the car door, my whole body quivering. Bee's head snaps toward me, her dark eyes wide. What's wrong, she asks, and under the weight of her stare, shame washes over me. Nothing, I say. I'm going to the concession stand. You want anything? The usual, she says and hesitates. You sure you're okay? I'm fine, I say, and stumble out of the car and across the lot, past the flushed couples, past everything, not looking back, not even when I'm sure I hear something in the hills laughing at me. And I will stop there. <laughs> How long was I out? Just like a few seconds, right? It wasn't that long. A few seconds, a few seconds. Yeah, Rebecca, you're 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 muted if you want to unmute and come on back in the conversation. So thank you so much, uh, Gwendolyn. That was a great reading. Um, and uh, I want to thank both of our guests tonight because we're we're getting towards the end of our show. So thank you so much to Rebecca Rowland. Uh, thank you so much to Gwendolyn Keist. Uh, Rebecca and Gwendolyn, when, once we end the broadcast, if you'll you'll stay in the backstage studio for a moment or two after. Um, thanks to our, our guests. There's a robust, uh, you, you've both got lots of conversation, uh, people uh, complimenting your readings and your work in the comments. Um, uh, again, uh, thank, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. If you'd like to stay in touch and support uh, Nighttime Logic, you, an easy way to do it is just hit subscribe. Uh, on Yahoo. Um, my name is Daniel Brom. My most recent book is Underworld Dreams. You could pick up a copy of that, but be sure to pick up a copy 
of Shagging the Boss by Rebecca Rowland and Reluctant Immortals by Gwendolyn Keist. We'll be back with Nighttime Logic on September 7th with Steve Berman and Norman Prentice. I hope uh, to see you there. Until then, uh, stay cool, stay safe, stay weird, stay inspired, everyone, and uh, have a great rest of the night and a great weekend. Thank you so much. Yay. Bye, everyone.